So our next speaker is Markus Landgraf, who currently works for the European Space Agency, ESA. You might have heard of them. They're like the NASA of Europe. Um, he's going to talk about space elevators because, you know, the rocket equation is pretty, is pretty unforgiving and the M drive doesn't really get you out of gravity wells. So we might need a space elevator. Please welcome our speaker. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Who of you have heard of the space elevator? <laughs> Who of you believes, to, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Who of you believes to see a space elevator in their lifetime? All right, okay, I get the picture. So most of you have heard about the space elevator and uh, about half, I would guess, um, believe it would become reality. So I would like to make it extra real for you tonight. Um, it's, it's about as real as it gets, I believe, uh, because I'm going to talk about the elevator to the moon. Um, since I'm, I'm also res representative of ESA, I would also like to talk about a little bit what ESA does today to go to the moon and why to go to the moon. So let me get, uh, give just a quick uh, overview on uh, why and how uh, one, anyone can get to the moon and then talk about why ESA goes to the moon today or uh, how, how we actually do that. And then we come to the really the, the, the core of the talk, which is beyond rockets, going beyond rockets. And of course, that's the elevator. And then talk about benefits because um, you, you're a big community. You're a very successful community. What draws you here? What, what really draws you here is the benefits that drive you. Everybody, you know, every one of you has, has, is looking for benefits, for fun, for knowledge, for, uh, you know, meeting people. And, and the community is really exists because you draw, draw benefits from it. And that's also true for anything that we try to do in, in society and space exploration is part of that. And that brings me to the final point, which is the community. I would also like to share a couple of links with you that will enable you to engage in the space elevator in lunar exploration in general and with ESA, of course. All right, enough said about the overview. So why the moon? Um, uh, this is a little fun bit that I put together and I would just read it to you. I will not comment on it because it is a bit the folklore about space and the moon. Um, and you can form your own opinion about those things. Some of them I will also talk uh, during my talk today. So there's this famous guy by the name of Bill Casing who of course says that Apollo was filmed in Hollywood studio. Uh, everybody who likes to watch uh, British animated films knows Wallace and Gromit and they insist that the moon is made of cheese, which solves their cracker problem. Uh, of course, you all know the Apollo program that ended in 1972. So there is an issue of the Time magazine that says soon robots will be intelligent, so there is no need to risk human lives. 2010, President Obama said, uh, while talking about the, his vision on the space program, that we have been there before. And I will leave that without any comments. And there's another nice movie uh, by the name of Iron Sky. And, and that movie, yeah, I like that too. And then, of course, in that movie, you have President Zara Perlin. And she says that, who are these guys anyway? Nazis from the moon. Wah, ha, 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 ha. So, so this is, I think, very inspirational folklore about the moon. Let's get to the to the real thing, why we explore space. Now, if I say we, I always, I'm in these talks with ESA, I'm always talking about us Europeans. But the European idea is bigger than Europe, so, so let's just feel as Europeans for a minute. Because the moon is in our exploration DNA, we Europeans are explorers, and I just, um, visited my hometown of Kassel in Hessen, a little bit south of here, um, a couple of uh, last days. And I took a picture there in a museum, uh, and that's a picture of 18th century artist, scientist, um, who, made, he, who observed the total eclipse of the moon. 
And he did that under contract of a nobleman in Kassel um, who sponsored you know, artists, scientists to come to his court and teach about science. So already 200 years ago and even earlier, we have been really engaged in science because we understand this is part of our cultural heritage. Actually, uh, this uh, nobleman is the grand-grand-grandson of another nobleman who hired a Swiss guy to come also to Kassel to measure the position of the stars in the sky. At the time, a very difficult un undertaking because the, sky, the stars move in the sky due to the Earth rotation. So you have to know the time very well if you want to tell what is the position of a star because it's, you know, if you don't know the time, it's moving all the, all, all the time. So this guy, Joost Burgi, made a clock. And that clock was so precise and it needed a third indicator, which was the indicator for the second. So the second, the time unit second, was invented in my hometown of Kassel. It's not many people know that. Uh, and that shows that exploration is not only in our DNA, but it is also to, to our benefit. Because without the second hand on our watches, we would be in trouble. Now, these days, we don't need them anymore. But, but it tells you that our everyday life is really much inspired by, insp uh, by, by inspiration and uh, inspired by exploration, of course. Another reason why we should go to the moon is discoveries. Now, a little bit arguing against President Obama, we have not been there. We have been in a couple of places which, which are very special, um, but the moon is largely unexplored country. Um, there's a nice book uh, by Arlene uh, Krotz, University Press. You can get it for cheap on any, even as an e-book, I believe. Let me cite him. Uh, there is a new moon. Many of the most dramatic recent discoveries in planetary science are lunar. Only in the past few years has lunar exploration accelerated again, and many do not realize how rapidly our knowledge of the moon is changing. I've just put two pictures here that are from recent observations of the moon. The upper right one is a hole that was punctured by a meteorite in the roof of a cave on the moon. Um, and the underground world of the moon, we have no idea what's inside there. Um, and of course, the first idea that comes to everybody's mind is we could live there. We could be protected from meteorites and from uh, solar radiation. Uh, the lower um, image is a nice, um, very mysterious region. It's called Aina. And Aina is apparently the tip of a volcano, ancient volcano, that blew away this dusty lid of the moon. So what you see here, this more bright stuff, is probably the real surface of the moon, while the rest of the real surface is still hidden under this dusty, little bit more dark, what people call the regolith. So there's so much more to explore. And certainly if aliens would come to Earth and would take a couple of samples in the Sahara Desert and some in the Gobi Desert, they could not claim that they've been on Earth and have explored Earth completely. So here's a philosophic take on it. And because it's philosophy, it has a lot of text. <laughs> I will not read that. I will ask you to read it after the talk and then report back to me what you take from it. No, I will just say the basic idea. So there are two schools of thoughts. One school of thought says there's limits to growth. Earth will run out of resources soon, so we better be very uh, careful with them. And the other school of thought, which is much less famous, says there, there's a limitless amount of resources because we are connected to the universe. And the latter one is called the extraterrestrial imperative, was formulated first time by Kraft Erike, a German philosopher who was also part of the team on, of the von Braun uh, engineering team that went to the United States to build the moon rock. And he basically says, nature has shown to us that whenever there is a limit, evolution will overcome that limit. And he gives the example of phytoplankton, which is a bacteria or a singular cellular organism that ran out of energy at some point, but discovered the reuse of an extraterrestrial energy source, which is the sun. So phytoplankton discovered by evolution how sunlight, which is extraterrestrial, could be used to make energy and store energy on Earth. 
And by the same token, he says, human technological development is a kind of evolution and we will be able to overcome that. And how do we overcome that is pretty clear that we use resources that are not from this planet. So this is the extraterrestrial imperative. The third reason why we should use the moon is, of course, you see this nice gravitational well that is made by the Earth, and it's difficult to get out of it because you need energy to get out. But the moon creates an extra spot there, which has this inter interesting structure that allows to put spacecraft in an equilibrium state uh, and, and put it like stations there so that you can reach the surfaces of the moon as well as deeper into the solar system. So really these three things, we can, it's in our culture, um, it, it, there is new knowledge to be gained and it is a great starting point for further exploration. So these three things are our reasons to explore the moon. Why is it so hard to go there? Why, are we, why did we stop? And the reason is the rocket equation. This is the rocket equation formulated by Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in 1895. It's basically an expression of the Newtonian law of mechanics that says to each reaction you need an equal but opposite reaction. And this is the only way to propel yourself in space. Uh, if I'm walking across the stage, what I'm doing is I'm pushing the stage behind me so that I'm propelled forward. And The, the link that makes it possible for me is my soles of the shoes. If there, was, if there was a slippery surface that would not allow the transmission of momentum between myself and the stage, I would just slip and fall. But if, and, and in that case, I would have to use reaction principle of Newton to propel myself. And in this formula, there's a very important parameter. It's the delta V that's on the left-hand side, which gives you the amount of how much you have to change your velocity to reach a certain target. And in the lower part, you see the numbers here that are not very important, but uh, it's very difficult to get from Earth into low Earth orbit, which is the first little uh, gravestone there, and then 3,200 meters per second to go to the lunar vicinity, and then on top to go to lunar orbit, you need another 800, and then to the surface of the moon, you need 2,000. If you know that our current technology limits us to use exhaust velocities, which is the VE there, um, of less than 5,000 meters per second, that it tells you why we need big rockets to launch small payloads. We need a 700-ton Ariane 5 rocket to launch a 10-ton satellite into geostationary transfer orbit. And that makes it so expensive. Now, expensive means, what is the economics of space transportation? And what you see on the right-hand side is much more interesting. Uh, this is a table of how much it costs today if you would go to a launch service provider to launch your stuff into space. In Earth orbits, is about 10,000 euros. Into cislunar space, is 10, time, 10 times that, so 100,000. To lunar orbit, 200,000 down to the surface of the moon, one million euro, one kilo. To bring anything back from the moon, 10 million euros. So if you would even would get back platinum or the most precious stuff that you can think of, it's still cheaper to get it on Earth. So forget about the space economy with rockets. That will not work. The only thing that the, the private sector can do is they can make space tra travel more efficient so that for the governmental players, everything becomes a little bit cheaper. But they will be never be able to get stuff from the moon and sell it here on Earth. That's just physically impossible if they use rockets. On the left-hand side, you see that actually the, 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 the cost raises with the square root of the mass. So if you have a big rocket, it's more expensive, but the rate of increase is lower than one. So that means uh, that for each kilo, you pay less if you have a big rocket. And that's why Ariane 5 is, for example, bigger than Ariane 4. So this is the economics of space transportation. This is the situation uh, that we have today. And in that situation, ESA has a program that, that takes us indeed to the moon. And um, I think just two slides about how ESA goes to the moon today. Like I said, the biggest problem is gaining access to the moon. Uh, and that is why there is the big blob. And then there is the little bit smaller but still challenging problem of surf surface operations. And these two problems really break down into smaller bits. We need 
to get to the moon, we need staging, so we have to change the vehicle, you know, let, it, let some you know, stages that already spent their fuel go away so that everything is lighter. Then we need landing, which is difficult because it's difficult terrain. And then we also have to launch from the moon, which is something that is incredibly difficult given the fact that already launching from Earth is difficult. And then you can break it down further. And each of these topical problems, ESA has a program. For example, to get humans, astronauts, go to cislunar space, we are cooperating with NASA to build a human space vehicle that will launch first time in 2018 around the moon. ESA proposes a program to build a habitation module for this cislunar habitat. This is a habitation staging post in, this is in cislunar space that will enable access to the lunar surface, but also into deeper space. Then ESA works together with Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, to build a landing system for lunar applications. And there is a camera that will first go in 2018, uh, 2019 um, to prepare our technology for landing on the moon. And then further down the road, we're working together with an international consortium or with international partners to build a demonstrator mission that does everything. So we land, we, we take off, and we have a little rover that shows mobility on the surface. And this is an integrated system that we are currently proposing to our member states. And the ESA would, would like to play the part of the ascent, getting away from the moon, launching a rocket from the moon is the problem here. Um, and then uh, the final uh, problem that we face is habitation on the lunar surface. And that is, um, that is of course, challenging. It's perhaps not as challenging as habitation in free space, but still there's difficult problems. Um, the f uh, the, another topic that still needs to be addressed is uh, getting resources from the moon, um, not necessarily to make money from it, like I explained, it's probably not going to uh, be a good, uh, good business, but uh, we already have a payload that tells us how we could use resources to sustain a base on the lunar surface. So, now this is a little bit of a time arrow, arrow here to show you how we want to develop that over, over time. So, the first thing is, uh, like I showed, this is the drill and the camera, and that goes already in 2018 and 2021 in two missions together with Roscosmos. Then there's the Orion vehicle, first launch in 2018, uh, the first human mission in 21. Then the cislunar habitat, uh, going to be built up somewhere around the mid-2020s, perhaps a little bit earlier. And then this interesting demonstration mission uh, in the mid-2020s. And then ESA does indeed plan or propose, in cooperation with international partners, to have a human mission or a series of human missions uh, to the moon to really start the exploration. But all of that is still limited by our transportation problem. But that's what we can do today. Like I promised, that's, that's the realism of the situation right now. But let's go beyond this. Go, let's go beyond rockets. Um, when I said that we can propel ourselves only in space only by pushing something back, you know, by actio equals reactio, I lied a bit. So I was not completely honest to you guys. Um, because if you have a physical connection to the planetary body that you're orbiting, then you can transmit momentum. And that physical connection is created by a space elevator. And the basic principle, I think really many people in the room already know it, so I will skip through it quite quickly. The idea is to have a long rope, and the rope has a center of mass, uh, and that center of mass is orbiting the planet in sync with the planet's rotation. So in the end, the rope will touch the surface of the planet, but will not necessarily exert a force in it. So it's simply, it's in, like a satellite, um, but it's going around the planet at the same rate as the planet is rotating. And then you can climb up and down that rope with, with a cabin. You know, you make a nice cabin around you with air and you can go up and down. And I'm no, I know your, your heads are full of questions and I'll try to answer some of them. And certainly the broader space elevator community can answer most questions today. So just as a start, the energy actually is not so much the problem. Indeed, we still have to provide the energy to go from Earth's surface up into the gravity well. 
But that's only one kilowatt hour per kilogram. And how much is kilowatt hour in Germany today? It's like 40 cent, I guess. Um, it's still twice the price than in France. Um, but never mind. Um, it's still cheap enough, right? Um, then the climber uh, can go up and down with electric energy, has electric motors uh, attached to that cable, can up, uh, go up and down. The cable is actually kept taut by the forces of gravity and centrifugal force. So gravity pu pulls the part to the left down and centrifugal force pulls it to the right up. So that the, the, the cable is always taut. Then, of course, as the climber goes up and down, the climber creates what's called the Coriolis force, and that puts the sideways force on the cable, and the sideways force creates a wave in the cable. And what does the wave do? Not much. Because of the high tension on the cable, and then left-hand side you see a couple of wiggly lines, which is the free motion of the elevator, and if you can read the small numbers, uh, we are talking about 700 meters of maximum um, uh, amplitude of, of that. Uh, and if you go to higher vibrational modes, it's, it's really not causing a lot, of, um, a lot of vibration in terms of spatial vibration. Of course, the, the, the cable for Earth, and this is the Earth cable, uh, would be uh, 154,000 kilometers long. So this is not to scale, right? On the y-axis you have 144,000 no, kilometers, on the y-axis you have just uh, kilometers. Um, and, and you see that this is the free motion of the cable, and by introducing a little bit of wiggle on the base of the cable, you can even manage that vibration. So if you have a vibration on it, you can cancel it out. So no problem. And the other side shows you what happens if the climber goes up, and this is actually on the moon cable, it's taken from a paper by Pearson et al., um, where when the, when the uh, climber goes up, you will have a bit of oscillation in the order of a couple of meters normally. Um, but it's not, it's certainly manageable. Okay, so let's talk about strong cables, um, because we need strong cables to kind of um, not make them rupture. So what's a strong material? I like to express st strength of a cable in terms of rupture length, because it expresses the strength of the cable at the same time as its specific weight. The rupture length is the length of a cable you can suspend it vertically in a 1G, constant 1G, without it snapping under its own weight. So steel cables are pretty strong. You can have 11 kilometers. If you make it 12, it would just go bang because of its own weight. Carbon fiber goes up to 330 kilometers. And a mystical material that's called multi-wall nanotube that exists only in laboratories in very small quantities makes it up to 3,300 kilometers. For Earth, you need, for Earth elevator, you need about 2,500 kilometers of rupture length. So, so this mystical material would be able to do the Earth elevator. Um, so, and there on the right hand side, you see other materials that are available today, and you see somewhere figures about 250 to 500 kilometers rupture length. L the longer, the better. Why does that, why is that important? Because the magic of the taper. People have been asking, how strong does the cable have to be to make a space elevator? And there was a paper by uh, Jeremy Pearson et al. in, uh, in Acta Astronautica 1975, and he explains you can do it from any, any material. You can even make it from steel, only you have to make it much thicker at the center of gravity than you make it at the base. Now, these taper ratios, how that is called, become so extreme for the Earth that for weak materials that the elevator becomes not feasible. So I show you this magical multi wall nanotube material that allows to have a space elevator from Earth uh, with a taper ratio of about eight or so. Um, material that exists today is, for example, carbon fiber or the famous honeycomb polymer. So that these are fibers you can buy in the shop today. And you can see for Earth, it would be like thousands of times thicker. And it's not a problem of making something thicker, but if you make something, you start with, say, a centimeter, and you have to make it 10,000 10 centimeters wide at this widest point, and the whole thing is 144,000 kilometers long, the total mass of this thing becomes humongous. 
Um, so that's not going to work. Um, so, so, but for Moon and Mars, this is much easier. You can see, and the reason is, of course, that Moon and Mars have lower gravity and they have slower rotational rates than the Earth. And then you end up saying that with existing materials, if I have a taper ratio of about eight or five or four, I can, I can make an elevator. So why are space elevators easier on the Moon than on Earth? We have a feasible ribbon material. Now we call this thing a ribbon, and I will come back uh, to why we call the rope a ribbon. Uh, we have very few artificial satellites around the moon that could potentially collide with the, with the cable, and we have no human-made space debris around the moon. And there is no atmosphere on the moon that could kind of, with chemical reaction, damage the cable. And there is no, there is no uh, strong trapped uh, radiation in, in, because there's no magnetic field around the moon. So, so the elevator around the Earth is quite futuristic. It is quite science fiction. But the elevator around the moon, it is still science fiction, but it's closer. So it's not 2031, it's 2000, 2001. So something. if you compare the movies, then you know what I mean. <laughs> right. So one word about the climber. Um, I know that the climber is the most inspiring part of the space elevator, but it's by far not the biggest problem. And in my life, I've always tried to crack the thickest nut first. So, you know, w one day when somebody gives me that cable, I will start talking about the climber. But there's a nice concept out there that basically runs onto wheels. You have an electric motor and you have solar arrays providing the energy, and you can have a couple of capsules attached to it that, you know, transport the, transport the payload. So what is it? that we get out of this moon elevator. Why should we do it beyond exploring the moon? Well, first of all, you remember that diagram, right? It made us a lot of headaches and stomach ache. But if you have a space elevator, the first thing that goes away is this, because you can go from moon orbit to the lunar surface. So this change in velocity that you need to make in order to go from moon orbit down to the surface, all of a sudden, um, goes away. So your rocket has to do much less work. Not only that, only this number goes away, another 800 meters per second, because you're starting already in the lunar vicinity. So this goes away. Your rocket makes even less work. So all you have to do is basically now you have to launch an Ariane 5 rocket. You get seven tons to the lunar surface. Today, with an Ariane 5, you get about 500 kilos. So less than, um, uh, yeah, roughly 10% of it. Um, but if we had, let's speculate a bit, if we had also an Earth elevator, you could also cancel those two figures. So the number that you see for delta V becomes zero. That means you can have a free transfer from the Earth's surface to the lunar surface. No propellant needed, and I'll show you in a minute uh, how that looks like. Oh, no, not in a minute, I show it you now. <laughs> right, this is a computer program, it's publicly available on, on the web, and I have the URL shared with you in my final slide. And what I've done, I've played with it, and you see in, this, in, the, in, this, in the crosshair, you see the Earth, and downward pointing is the Earth elevator. And on this central ring, you see the moon with a long line and extending with a blue dot at the end, that's the moon elevator. Now, I put a payload that's the little green dot down there. Um, let, me, let me find my cursor so I can, I can play with it. Okay, so there is my payload, right? So now I'm starting to uh, uh, let the Earth rotate, and you see the uh, time scale up there is 512. Uh, so it's a factor of 512 over real time. So the Earth rotates, and the payload goes with the elevator, of course. And while the Earth rotates, of course, the Moon is moving slightly, but much, more, much less uh, fast. When this reaches the 90-degree position, I let go. So this payload will just be detached from the cable, and then this will describe a free-fall trajectory to wherever it takes it because of the laws of gravitation. And then now I've sped it up to 8,192 to make it a little bit faster so you don't have to wait to sit here all evening because things, as they go farther away from Earth, they go slower. 
And then what you can do, and you see now every turn of the Earth is of course one day, is that at some point you find a trajectory where you can, this object can fly a rendezvous with your moon elevator. And you can just latch on and then descend on the moon elevator all the way to the lunar surface. So, so you would have a direct connection from the Earth to the moon and the other way around. From the moon you can bring any material, pl platinum, gold, from the lunar surface back to Earth without any use of propellant. And of course what that would do is to enable us to make real use of space, economic use of space. We could create structures that are so humongous that they would just you know, collect enough sunlight, for example, 24-7 to provide Earth with energy. You know, this is a little animation showing uh, you use microwaves to beam the energy down to the, lunar, uh, to the Earth's surface. Um, and, and you can make these structures, you can make space hotels, because all of a sudden you've broken this, you hacked celestial mechanics. And uh, I think that's the basic idea. This is why uh, there is interest in the space elevator. So my final thought here is that perhaps if you want to um, uh, engage in space exploration and the moon exploration, and I would also like to uh, point you towards the talk by uh, my boss, actually, Jan Werner, uh, the Director General of ESA, at uh, 8 o'clock in, in room number one. And he will talk about the Moon Village and how this uh, community will make it happen that we will engage into lunar exploration. And final word on the community, here are a couple of links, emails, uh, Twitter names and URLs that you can use when you download the presentation to make it happen and be part of the space elevator. Thank you. We have a rather generous half hour for Q&A, so please get ready to queue the microphones for questions. There's basically microphones everywhere, so just queue. And also, of course, as always, we have questions from the internet. So if you're in the chat watching the stream, we'll take care of you as well. We'll just start with microphone two, please. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. So what I was uh, wondering uh, is uh, that you did not mention at all if uh, there is uh, going to be an uh, extra uh, problem that uh, the cable will have to take care of, that is the stretching due to the difference in gravity as it goes along the gravity well. Is that going to be a problem or is that a very minor factor? Thanks for the question. Uh, I, I hid that, of course. Um, and the answer is that the Pierce model is made such that the tension on the cable is constant through the cable by making it thicker at the place of the biggest force. Mm. Because you know tension equals force divided by cross section squared, uh, by cross section. And then uh, that's taken care of. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we get to the next question, just a little announcement. Please try to be quiet. And if you need to leave, leave very, very quietly. And if you don't have to leave very urgently, just do us the courtesy and wait until the end of the talk. Thank you. Uh, could we get an internet question, please? Could we get the microphone, please? Yeah. Question work. Uh, thanks, Wade. Okay. Is it already known how the elevator affects the Earth rotation? It does not at all. Uh, there's of course a small value. Uh, you know that by nature effects the Earth uh, speeds up when it contracts because of its cooling down, but it normally it slows down because of the presence of the Moon. Attaching a, um, a lunar cable of about a thousand tons will not affect any, because the Moon is much more heavy. Could we get microphone number seven, please? My question is, what will this mean for future uh, further space exploration missions uh, that, uh, what are the implications for further space exploration missions starting from the moon or does that have, uh, are there any implications for this? Uh, 
Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, there are, and of course that's part of the deal that we try to prepare deeper space missions by making propellant on the lunar surface and then transporting it into cislunar space, which could be then a starting point for Mars missions or Jupiter missions, or even at some point missions to Proxima Centauri. But I, I, that's an extra talk. <laughs> Thank you. Mic number one, please. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I'll try to keep the question brief and feel free to direct me to the next uh, talk by your boss if you feel like he could answer the question better. But it seems to me that most of the um, reasons for uh, going to the moon, apart from the uh, science, of course, which is important, uh, could be solved easier from low Earth orbit. Um, I'm thinking specifically of uh, refueling spacecrafts, and I believe that the low Earth orbit fuel depots could be refueled from asteroids, and you wouldn't need to build a space elevator on the moon. I'm with you 100%. And of course, my boss can answer any question better than I can. <laughs> but uh, let me give it a try. <laughs> let me give it a try. Uh, of course, that's actually my day job. So I'm looking at architectures of exploration to find out what, you know, what's the best way. And you're right. If you were, if your goal was to have a, a Mars mission or a series of Mars missions that use refueling, then you would per perhaps not use fuel from the lunar surface. You would use asteroids and transport the material, not necessarily to low Earth orbit because of the high delta V penalty. But you're right. There, there's competing things. And the real reason for this lunar elevator to just make it clear, is if you want to exploit the moon economically for not necessarily uh, use it for further space exploration, but for bringing precious metal to the Earth, that would be the real reason uh, for the lunar elevator. But do we not also have access to those materials in the asteroids? Uh, not necessarily. If you have to bring it uh, if you have to bring it out of interplanetary space, because you have to then fly a re-entry trajectory, and that is very expensive. But let, let's take that offline. Sure. Thank you. Do we have internet questions? Yes. Why are carbon nanotubes or graphene so bad materials? Can, can you repeat, please? I didn't catch that. Okay. Nanotu uh, carbon nanotubes yeah. or graphene has been... Um, Materials that have been talked about a lot, um, were, were there so bad materials for the elevator? No, they're good materials, but they're not there yet. Uh, that's the thing. <laughs> um, I gave a talk in 2013 on TEDx. Whoever wants to Google Landgraf space elevator finds that on YouTube. Um, and there I'm talking about how to make that possible. And, uh, and um, you can tell from my talk back then that I was a little bit younger at the time and a little bit uncertain. So. And that's why, and then it's, and that's exactly the, the reason is that the, uh, that the nanotubes are not there yet. So, thanks for the question. Number eight, please. Um, so, hi, up here. Hi. Yeah. Ah, uh, up there. So you, you talked about uh, that we have the material to build a lunar moon elevator, but not the Earth one. So, is it possible to make the Earth cable just shorter and then use a rocket to connect to the? lower part of the elevator. That is true. And um, um, so? you were invited to give a talk next year about that. <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, there's a whole community out there about space tethers. And, and yes, there's uh, options, but they're sometimes risky because you have to fly a rendezvous with the end of the cable. Uh, and ESA even was involved in tether experiments back in the 90s. Um, so yes, there is a community out there that trades make, make, makes it possible. But uh, the real benefit that solves a lot of operational problem is when you create a real elevator that actually attaches to the celestial, celestial body. I have a follow-up question. If you have a space tether, hmm? don't you need fuel on board to reposition it? Otherwise, it flies away or it comes back. Comes correct. Back that is correct. And uh, the, normally, people use, uh, solve that problem by making a low thrust transfer using uh, solar electric propulsion or using the Earth's magnetic field by putting in electric power, so there's all kinds of solutions for that. Cool, thanks. Welcome. Could we get number six, please? Uh, when you travel to the moon, an obvious advantage of rocket-based transportation is that you can more or less freely choose the point of your landing. Yes. So would that uh, space elevator concept allow 
to reposition the, the elevator so you can more freely choose where you're going? Yes, uh, there is a paper that I'm citing also in this talk uh, by Pearson uh, in 2005 or 8, um, uh, where they basically connect the elevator to a tramway. So they bend the elevator a bit to higher latitudes and then starting from that higher latitude points to a tramway. But in any case, you can once you're on the surface, you can drive. I mean, you know, come on, take your, take your all-wheel drive and just go. Or, you know, there, there's more easy solutions to that than, than uh, with a rocket. And you're right, with a the, with the rocket you can choose your landing site freely. Could we get mic number three, please? Yes, um, I have a question about the failure state and how it differs from, uh, for an uh, Earth cable and the Moon cable. So I, I would guess uh, uh, an Earth cable would burn up in the atmosphere if something goes wrong. Um, what would it be for a Moon cable? So, so first of all, the, the Moon cable, if it disconnect so that there is one part coming back, it would just impact lunar surface and be destroyed up upon impact. Normally with hypervelocity impacts you get a complete obliter obliteration of the material and about only 10% or even 5% stay on the surface, the rest goes into the solar wind. Um, but that, not, that's, that doesn't have to take place. You can always sever the cable per on purpose when you have a break. And um, there are a couple of other things, other reasons that I didn't explain in my talk why potentially the you can make it so that the cable never breaks. Mic number four, please. I saw in your slides that the calculations about the cable wobble were taken with elevator speeds of about 250 kilometers yep. per hour. Yep. Um, calculating that the cable from Earth would be about 150,000 kilometers long, um, I make that 4.5 weeks yep. around that. Um, so the whole transfer would take multiple months. Yes. Are there any plans on sending humans up with that space elevator or would rockets be like Right. Cheaper because they're faster. The, the only reason we have unmanned space program is because you can you cannot make small humans. <laughs> and and if you have a system that is so capable like the space elevator, you would take humans from day one. Okay. So so yes, and they would just have the food for for five five months. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, technically, we have small humans. Very small humans. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, could we get another question from the internet, please? Yes, how about the voltage generated by the magnetic field of the elevator? Would it be a risk or another sh source of energy? Uh, both. Uh, for the Earth elevator, it could be an, a source of energy, um, or depending on the material you choose. But for the Moon elevator, there is no voltage because there is no global magnetic field around the Moon. Number eight, please. You said um, a space elevator from Earth is not possible with materials we know. Um, what is about uh, a launch loop or something like that? Uh, 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 so you're talking you, about... You try to uh, connect both um, ends of cable yeah, to the Earth and... Ah, okay. Uh, I haven't looked at that concept, never heard of it. But thanks for the inspiration, I will look it up. Uh, launch loop, you said. So like, like you have both ends on the Earth and then with centrifugal force you can... Yeah. Okay, the tension will probably be the same. But uh, let, let, me, let me check it out, it sounds interesting, thank you. Could we get number three, please? Yeah, hi. Coming back to your question from the beginning, whether we will see this in our lifetime or not, can you give an estimate, maybe an optimistic or realistic estimate on the timeline? How far is the research? So, so if I was president of the world, we'll have it in 2050. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends very much on the decisions that are taken on a global scale in these days. Uh, just look at the, the new US administration and some movements here in Europe that are detrimental to the efforts of gaining more knowledge. Um, so, but if we take the path of knowledge, I'm pretty sure that we'll have moon pro well, ESA plans to have a moon program in the 2030s. And the moon village will be 
implement it that, that Jan Werner will talk about, I'm pretty sure we'll have a permanent settlement on the moon somewhere in the mid-2030s. Um, and, then, and then the necessity of having an efficient transport system will force people to build a space elevator. And that will be then 2050. And uh, I, I plan on being around that long. Mic number four, please. On the topic of uh, focusing resources, so we talked about the cost effectiveness of rockets, but we didn't talk about redeem, uh, re reusable rockets as pushed for now by Elon Musk and SpaceX. I was wondering if you could talk about the cost effectiveness of reusable rockets versus space elevators in terms of focusing our resources that we right. have currently. Right. Great question. Thank you. We know from Elon uh, that that uh, rockets, reusable rockets are about 30% better than non-reusable ones, right? Uh, so that brings down uh, anything back to the moon uh, from 10 million to uh, 900, uh, 9 million 700 uh, thousand per kilogram. Um, so that's great, but it's still rocket technology. Uh, the space elevators are estimated to lower that by a factor of 100. Um, now, that includes the initial investment, but assuming that the initial investment will be less than 10% of the uh, turnover. So the turnover, of course, you have to put a lot of um, business in it to make it work. And that's the, that's the problem with the space elevator. If there is not enough business for it to do, then people will never engage in it. Thank you. Mic number six, please. Uh, so thanks for the talk at first and so from our talk I guess that the moon elevator is currently already technically feasible or buildable so are there any plans or what's the timeline? Um, the, the ESA has not a spa does not have a space elevator program. Uh, we have made a couple of experiments with space tethers uh, that were quite successful, and we have that in our knowledge base. The reason why ESA is not engaging in it is because our task is to enable research for our member states. And uh, research is not the prime target of the space elevator. Um, there is a space elevator consortium, and you will find something on the, um, uh, for example here, the one that I showed, the liftport.com, uh, you will find that they have a timeline in them, and it's a private consortium, and their plan is to make a business case for the um, space elevator. Okay, thanks. Mike, number two, please. Thank you. At first, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have the question, uh, there's often the argument that we shouldn't engage in human space travel because of the costs and the risks, and it's really, really um, hard. Uh, what would you give as an argument against that? Uh, so I'm in space business since 16 years, so I have answered that question a couple of times. So forgive me if I feel a little bit superior at this stage. Um, so, so first of all, the cost is not tremendously high. And don't forget, any euro that you put in a space program does not go to space. The euro stays here, and we've done a benefit analysis by ESA that roughly for each euro invested by our member states, they get five euros back. And I can tell you about the details if you, if you want. Um, the second uh, thing is that, that space is right now, we're looking at about uh, 1% or less than one, much less than 1% of national spending. So there is, it's not a big part of the national budget. The third point about the risk is human spaceflight risk is really only to the astronauts. And they have a contract that says, you have a risky job. Are you ready to take that risk? And they say, yeah, sure. I go, you know, go ahead. <laughs> And so that's the risk bit, and that was it, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, also the point that we can do it without humans or people. Yeah. Tell me, right. I'm, I'm not really behind this. Right, argument. right, I understand. Tell me that we can do it without humans. Yeah. So why don't we do right. it? Right. So I cannot exclude that possibility that someday we will have intelligent machines. <clears throat> but I've tried to. No, I, I've, I fooled a security ca camera the other day <laughs> by just having my glasses, my shades, hanging out of my mouth, right? Not putting them on, just put them in your mouth. No security camera will recognize your face. So, so that tells you there is not intelligent computers today because the security sector has billions and billions of euros to spend on this stuff. Um, 
And you know, like I said in my beginning, in 1972, there was an article which said that there will be intelligent robots very soon, and I am still waiting for them. I'm sorry. But it could be there in 20 years. No, could be. Thank you. Could we get the internet, please? Yes, this <laughs> is a quite practical question. How would you deploy and fix the cable? Uh, yeah, that's a brilliant question, and I skipped that in my talk, and apologies for that. Um, thanks, and that's why the question gives me an answer, opportunity to answer it. So, a rocket would bring roughly a hundred to a thousand ton cable to the liberation point, to this stable point that I showed before, and then from that point on, the cable would be deployed at the same rate, upwards and downwards maintaining the center of gravity at that stable point and doing a little bit of station keeping, not too much. And once deployed, it will stay there for decades. So, so then after that, you can launch another rocket, very small one, with the, with the climber and fly a rendezvous, attach it, and then it could go up and down any time. So it's really... And I would refer the, 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 the person who has asked the question also to the... Um, Space Elevator Wiki that I'm listing here on my links, uh, because there is some, some information there. Mic number three, please. Um, hi, I have two questions. The first one is, um, how are we going to build the cable? Is it, are we transporting materials from Earth to Moon, or are we going to mine it from there? And the second question is, um, how are we going to build the cable? Are we using like 3D printers mm. or... Yeah. So, so first part of the question, both options exist. So you can bring everything from Earth there. Um, that's the more expensive way, but the more safe way. Um, the other uh, alternative is you bring a small pilot cable, and then you start building strands of the cable and pull it along the pilot cable up, and then make a thicker cable out of the pilot cable. Uh, through, through a, that's a cheaper and less risky one. And uh, yes, 3D printing is definitely an option. And I actually deleted one slide that showed how the structure of the cable is, uh, because I, I wanted more of your questions, so I deleted slides. So, so <laughs> the, the idea is to have like a crisscrossing set of strands that would allow a breakage of one strand without the cable breaking. Or you can make it the breakage of five strands without breaking of the cable. And by that way, and also that would allow then uh, crews to go up and fix the cable. If there's a broken strand, they would go up, desplice the cable, and then uh, get the strand out, put, uh, insert a new splice, and pull a new cable thing and adjust the tension on it. Thanks. Welcome. Could we get number six, please? Uh, Arthur C. Clarke has written the book Fountain of Paradise and where he described the elevator concept. And they have many papers written about this concept too, using hyperbolic structures, like all independent all in drilling platform are using it also. And I would like to know, have you already calculated an equation? How much, how much time would it take to lift up a human being from Earth to Moon. And the sea global space exploration strategy, is this because it looks like the International Space Station will be up until 2025, at least the financing is uh, secured until then. And what it will be after next, is it also possible to use the ISS for, as a springboard, as is often mentioned, to the moon? Okay. Thank you. Th thanks. So, it, three parts, right? So, yes, I know Fountain of Paradise, a very good book, and it's really about the economic and socio-economic impact of a space elevator. So that's very interesting. Thanks for mentioning that. Now, the technical solutions and discussions that are in this book, and Arthur C. Clarke is an engineer, um, are very interesting. And honestly, I haven't looked into them. So, so very much there is a lot of interesting solutions there for the anchor point. Uh, the second part of the question was about the, um, the travel time, and that was answered by a colleague before. So we're talking about months. If you have a slow elevator, you can speed it up. You know, you're in vacuum, so you can go a thousand kilometers an hour uh, without too much damaging your haircut. Um, so, so that would work. So cut it down from a couple of months to a couple of weeks. 
Uh, and the third question was, the Global Space Exploration is the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. And thanks for that question, because in that group, we're preparing the next steps, ESA together with NASA, with Roscosmos, with the Chinese Space Agency. And the next step will very likely be the, uh, the creation of a small staging outpost in Cislunar space. Could we get microphone number one, please? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, uh, two small questions. The first one, one might seem na a little naive, but once the elevator is in place, um, to climb up the elevator, wouldn't that apply a downward momentum? How do you keep the, the rope in, in place? Right. Um, yes, but it's so small uh, that the, the, for a one-ton cabin, you would have a um, you would have a thousand-ton cable. It's a two-ton. The two-ton climber would have a, a thousand-ton cable, uh, simply because of the math, how it works out, and you can check the, the papers. So the C COG would go a little bit slow, uh, lower, and you can compensate that by a little bit of motion below. It's, it's, it's intricate. So the, the horizontal motion by a mobile platform that travels 100 meters on the lunar surface can compensate, can provide the energy uh, to attach it. Once you have attached this, uh, this um, uh, cabin, then it climbs up and the COG will approach again its original state. But these are minute changes, and mainly they, they cause oscillations that then have to be managed in horizontal mode. Okay. And uh, the other question was, um, say we managed to build an elevator on the moon, but um, the whole technical thing for the Earth just doesn't work out, right. and so we are stuck with just an elevator on the moon. Yes. Uh, how useful would that actually be? So, so the usefulness of that, uh, let me go, get back to that image, is this. So you cut the, 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 the delta V in half, enabling reusable rockets going to and from the moon. So it will be about half as expensive as it is today, so you're cutting from 10 million to 5 million. Is that enough for economy? I don't know. Okay. So it would be better, but it wouldn't solve the problem yes. uh, at all? Yes, exactly. It's incomplete. Okay, yes. thank you. Number two, please. Okay. Uh, so you talked about economy, and I wondered, um, is there any concerns about who owns the moon, or may we face the next war on resources in 2050? Yeah. There is, a, uh, there is a consensus officially by the UN, which means that nobody can, no nation can own the moon. And that includes, by the way, private companies, because each private company has to have its legal framework set up by a nation. Um, but of course, you know, things always go different than the official ways. And already now, there is a lot of discussion about who owns the moon. And I think we will have to wait for the war. Maybe that's a chance to occupy the moon. Yes. Uh, could, we, could we get a question from the internet? Traveling from moon back to Earth via elevator, would you mainly use the atmosphere to break or would you have to have some propellant? Uh, you don't need either. Because when you go down on the cable, you will be co-rotating with Earth. So unless there is a high altitude wind, there will be no friction with the atmosphere. So which basically go that the air would become ever denser as you go down, you know, basically the first 140, no, 140, oh man, uh, 130,000, no, oh man, this, this math on stage is just terrible. Mental math on stage, you should try it one day. So, um, so the first 99.999% of the cable, you'll be in vacuum. And then the last bit, the last 30 kilometers, so, so you know, 144,000 minus 30. Um, the last 30 kilometers, you would be in the air, and then you would feel the air becoming thicker, and of course, high in the atmosphere, you have some winds, you know, you have the jet stream, but at that stage, you will still be in your little cabin until you reach about 3,000 meters, um, when you can basically get off the lift if you want. One last question from number one. Please make it short if you can. Of course. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for the nice talk. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, 
My, my question is quite similar to the one from Mike too, just now, uh, but not the question who would own the moon, but uh, who would own uh, the elevator? Because uh, if you're not the president of the world, um, uh, obviously in space things go far better together than on Earth, uh, like an ISS and something. Uh, but uh, due to the cost of the elevator, uh, what do you think? Will it be a public project uh, like with ESA and NASA or will it be something like SpaceX on private investors? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, my, my, and I, I really haven't thought this, this through, uh, but my answer would be very likely it's going to be private because the benefits are really entrepreneur benefits. Uh, by getting material from the moon or building big infrastructures in space that offer services. Um, so, so I would guess would be private. And then your question is very relevant because it's a huge, powerful piece of infrastructure. Is that even possible to have a private entity owning it without uh, interfering with national interests and national strategic interests? Because in the end, you could bomb any place on the earth from that elevator if you want. So perhaps some nations are not very happy to have a private company controlling this thing. And that is a little bit also addressed if you, if you read uh, Arthur C. Clarke's Fountain of Paradise, because then this whole problem becomes very clear. And I, had, I don't have a good answer for you. Sorry. Thank you. So we are out of time. Please thank our future president. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.